Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video series where we talk a lot about random experiments and the theory behind them. And in today's part 20, we will consider so-called random vectors and their marginal distributions. Indeed, this is a very important topic because often we have random variables in several variables. For example, we could imagine that we throw a point randomly into a triangle like that. And let's say we do that uniformly distributed. However, now it can happen that we are only interested in the x1 component of the outcome of this random experiment. And then, of course, a natural question arises, is this x1 component also uniformly distributed? And if not, can we calculate the correct distribution for this new random variable? And indeed, this is exactly what we call marginal distribution and the thing we will discuss today. However, before we go into the details, first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, on Patreon or by other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you can download the PDF version and the quiz for this video with the link in the description. Ok, then let's start by writing down the random variable we want to consider today. As always we call it x and it goes from omega into rn. So you see, since the outcome is a whole vector, we often call this random variable a random vector. Hence, this is not a complicated thing, you could say you just put n ordinary random variables together. And obviously, these components we simply would denote by x1, x2, x3 and so on. Now, in order to keep the video tidy enough, I would say let's just consider the x1 component. This makes the whole notation here a little bit simpler and of course all the other components work exactly the same. Ok, so now we have the setup and also the question we have already asked, if we know the distribution of x, can we say something about the distribution of x1? So in the example above this means we know x is uniformly distributed, but what does it mean for x1 just on the x1 axis here? And indeed, it turns out that we can exactly calculate that. However, I would say before we do this calculation, let's first look at this setting in an abstract way. Now, it should not be a surprise for you that we have three probability spaces involved here. On the left hand side here, we have the abstract one given by the set omega. And then by using the map x, we go into the very concrete probability space given on Rn. And you know, usually we just say we have the Borel sigma algebra part there. However, now most importantly, there we have the distribution measure Px. So in our context here, we assume that we know that. Ok, and then here in the last step, what happens is that we project Rn to one component. In other words, this is a very ordinary projection map. So not complicated at all, you just ignore all the other components. And as I told you before, we will just consider the case of the first component here. Indeed, I would say you will not have a problem to generalize that to the other components. Ok, and now the distribution we get on the right hand side here is what we call the marginal distribution. And of course, this is exactly the distribution for the new random variable we call x1. Therefore, if we call this projection map just t, it's no problem to write down the definition for the marginal distribution. Indeed, the actual interesting thing in the end will be the calculation of this marginal distribution. But of course, first we need the exact definition here. So the distribution of x1 is given as the distribution of t with respect to px. In other words, we have to write px t. In fact, I would say with the picture above, this is easy to understand. Ok, and now this is what we call the marginal distribution of the random vector x. And if we want to be more precise, we would say it's the marginal distribution with respect to the first component. Now, if you want to be more concrete and want to calculate some marginal distributions, it might be helpful to look at the corresponding distribution functions. And you know, the common name we use for them is a capital F. So in this case we would have capital F x1 of a real variable t. So here please don't forget, 
this t here has to live on the x1 axis. And moreover, you should know in short we call that a CDF and it's defined as the measure from minus infinity to t. And now not so surprising, the official name for that is marginal cumulative distribution function. And we can calculate that by using the original distribution of x. Indeed, the only thing we have to do here is to look at the projection t. This means only the first component is important and the other components don't matter at all. Hence, they could have any real value, so we put in r for each component. And only our chosen first component has to lie between minus infinity and t. So not so complicated, here we just have our projection t at work. Okay, and then in the last step, of course, we could also write that with our abstract measure p. Indeed, this is what you often see, the short notation where we say that x1 is less or equal than t. And all the other components are not fixed at all. Therefore, let's include them by writing x2 in r and so on. Okay, so now we have the important definitions and now we want to see how we can calculate with them. And in fact, I would say it's nicer to work with the densities instead of the CDFs. Simply because with the densities, we always have two important cases. Of course, you already know that, we always can discuss the so-called absolutely continuous case and the discrete case. And I think it would be nice to start with the continuous case first. This means that the distribution of our random vector x has a so-called probability density function. And as always, we use a lowercase f for the notation. And now don't forget, this function is defined on the whole Rn. And I write it maps into R, but you already know it has to be a non-negative function. And also recall the second property of this function is that the integral is exactly 1. So for example here we can say we have R2 and then we sketch the graph of f. Hence what we get could be such a two-dimensional surface here. So this is not so hard to imagine, there we see the distribution of the probabilities for x. Okay, now you know, this picture we have to project to one axis. This means now in the pre-image we only have one axis. Moreover, the new graph of our new density function is just an ordinary one-dimensional graph. So you see, what we have to do here is to press this two-dimensional graph together such that we get a one-dimensional graph out. Indeed, we are not allowed to lose any probabilities because in the end, the integral for the new function still should be 1. Therefore, maybe for this picture here, it's better to look at the contour lines. So here you see, we have the domain R2 again, and now let's do a very rough sketch where we find all the probabilities. So this is what I want here. We have some contour lines. We see we have a high probability in the middle and a low probability in the outer area. And now for our projection here, we have to push all the probabilities in the vertical direction to the x1 axis. This means to get the probability here at the 1x1 value, we have to sum up all the probabilities here on the vertical line. And only then we get the correct probability distribution here on the x1 axis. So you see, if we do that in the correct way, we get out the density function for our random variable x1. And of course, with that knowledge, we can also write it down as a definition. So for a given number t here on the x1 axis, we just have to sum up all the other probabilities. And of course, summing up in the continuous case means we have to calculate an integral. So let's use our original probability density function and let's put in t, x2, x3 and so on. And now we integrate with respect to all the variables but t. In other words, we have n minus 1 integrations here. Indeed, here in the picture for R2, we just had one integration in the x2 variable. Okay, and now since all these integrations work for each number t, we call the resulting function the marginal probability density function with respect to the first variable. In fact, this is now a very nice thing because often we calculate with the density functions if we have random variables. 
Okay, and now I would say we can also look at the discrete case here. Of course, you might already guess it's very similar. Instead of integrals, now we have sums. And indeed, this is what happens, because instead of a density function, now we have a probability mass function. And usually we call this one lowercase p with an index x. And now this x can be any vector in Rn, so we say x goes through Rn. However, you know for the discrete case, this here should be a countable sequence. Therefore, we definitely have to include the property here that only countably many of these px are non-zero. This means, in theory, we are capable of writing down the countable sequence. However, by including zeros, it's easier to write down the definitions. So for example, the definition of the marginal probability mass function with respect to x1 looks very simple now. And as before, we call the function lowercase p with index t, while t goes through r. So you see, this is very similar to the continuous case, we just have to get rid of all the other components. And what the integral was before will now be the sum sign. Hence, instead of lowercase f, now we have our lowercase p with n components. And of course, the first one is our t again. And we also put in all the other ones, but you already know, we will sum over them. Hence, in the sum index, we have x2, x3, and so on, going through all real numbers. Indeed, this is still a well-defined sum or series, because inside only countably many terms are non-zero. Therefore, what we get out here is a well-defined probability mass function. Okay, so now this is the theory for both cases, and now I would say, let's look at the example from the beginning again. So now we know how to answer the questions from the beginning. First, recall we had a random vector in R2, which was uniformly distributed on a triangle. And now let's say we call this triangle delta, and the length of each side should be 1. This means we have 1 here and 1 there. Therefore, the probability density function for x is not hard to write down. So it's constant inside the triangle and 0 outside. In fact, we see the value inside has to be 2. Simply because the whole area of this triangle is exactly 1 half. And you know, the density function has the property that if we integrate it, we get the result 1. Okay, and now we know we can calculate the marginal probability density function with respect to the first component. So after calculating that, we know how the x1 values are distributed in this random experiment. And indeed, we should already see that they will not be uniformly distributed. In fact, we should see the probability in this area on the right is very small compared to the probability here on the left area. And obviously, this will come out of the calculation. Okay, and now we know, by definition, we have to get rid of the x2 variable by integration. So we integrate dx2 here. So now we should see, we have two cases again, because we definitely have 0 if t is outside of the triangle. More precisely, this means that t is outside of the 0, 1 interval. However, we definitely get a value if t lies inside this interval. In fact, we also see what we have to integrate. For a given t, we have to integrate this line there. In other words, we integrate from 0 to the point 1 minus t. And the function inside is the constant function 2 as given in this definition there. So please recall, the function 1 minus t we exactly see here as the line in the picture. So indeed, this is the only distribution we get for the full integral here. And of course, this is not hard to solve, we get 2 minus 2t. And of course, the other case is still 0. Okay, there we have it. This is the result of the marginal probability density function with respect to the first component. And now you can check that this is indeed a density function, because the integral with respect to the variable t gives us 1. So not a surprise, but always a good check after some calculations. Okay, but here now please note, this is not a constant function, so this variable 
is not uniformly distributed. Therefore, this is a good example to know that the marginal distributions are very important. This means if you want to extract one information of a random experiment, you really have to check what is the new correct distribution of that. And in fact, often this happens by calculating the corresponding marginal probability density function. Okay, and then I hope that this helped you and that we will meet again in the next video. Have a nice day and bye bye. Thank you.